Welcome again to our weekly online Bible class here at Pine Valley Church of Christ. We are finishing today our study of the first letter of Paul to Timothy, as this has been part of a series of lessons that have focused on the writings or teachings of individuals, godly people at the end of their lives and the thing they want to focus on, whether it was uh, Solomon and Ecclesiastes, whether it was Peter and his letters, and now we're focusing on these final letters of Paul and his life, and began with Titus, now we're finishing 1 Timothy, and next week we will begin 2 Timothy, which is the last letter he wrote before he died. As we come to chapter 6, uh, we are coming to that conclusion, and he sort of brings everything together, and we have noticed a familiar pattern throughout the book. In the first three chapters, he emphasizes first the teachings of the false teachers and Timothy's responsibility to confront them and deal with them. Then he moves on to Timothy and his own uh, spiritual life and the things he needs to do in his uh, preparation and in his teaching, and then moves on to those different groups within the church family that he is to teach and what he is to teach them. And it, that pattern repeats itself in chapters four and five, the first three verses of chapter six. We see the same thing here in his conclusion. He begins in verse four of chapter six with his uh, discussion repeating uh, the urgency of dealing with the false teaching that is going on at this time. And at the very end of the chapter, he refers to all of it as dangerous chatter. And that's the thing that we want to really see what he is trying to share with us here as he talks about you know, these things which are not healthy, as we've seen throughout the, his letter to Titus and throughout 1 Timothy. We'll see it again, 2 Timothy. Uh, many translations have the phrase sound doctrine, which can be translated better understood as healthy teaching, what leads to a healthy spiritual life and relationship with God and leads to godliness. It is totally opposite what the false teachers are doing, which he refers to as uh, other or dangerous or uh, contrary uh, to the gospel of God. And, you know, we've, we've seen his discussion of them, uh, going back to chapter one, as he begins, he wants them, uh, he talks about these people who teach different doctrine or different teachings, pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, promote endless empty speculations, rather than God's plan, which operates by faith. They are confusing people, they are seeking to bring uh, disciples to themselves, uh, it's a very selfish approach to the whole thing in which they take. Uh, he says, I want you to help people remember that God's plan is by faith, and the goal of all of this is love. Our love for God, our love for Christ, love for the gospel, and our love for one another, which they are not promoting. Uh, it says in verse 7, they want to be teachers of the law, although they don't understand what they are saying. Uh, and he says, this is all contrary, verse 10 and 11, chapter 1, to sound teaching or healthy teaching, which is based on the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is entrusted to me. This message, he says, is what I have dedicated my life to ever since my conversion to Christianity. And he is encouraging Timothy to do the same, which, as he says, you've already done, but he wants to encourage him to continue on. He picks the same thing up in uh, chapter four, uh, talks about this dangerous chatter as actually being teachings that come from deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. He knows that Satan is behind all of this, uh, pushing uh, selfish indulgence upon these false teachers and what they seek, and they, uh, they're hypocritical liars, 
Their consciences are seared. They forbid marriage and demand abstinence from foods that God created uh, to receive thankfulness. Uh, so they're promoting this ascetic kind of lifestyle. It's better, uh, you're more spiritual if you remain unmarried or if you uh, don't eat certain foods like the Jewish uh, food regulations. And there seems to be this blend of the Jewish law with uh, Greek philosophical thought of the time and it all leading really to uh, the promotion of these false teachers as being more spiritual, more uh, enlightened uh, than Paul or anyone else, and that, that's why people should listen to them. And so he picks that same thought up here in chapter 6 as he begins with these false teachers, and he reminds Timothy of what he is to teach in contrast to it. Uh, and sort of summary of everything that he taught or told him to talk various groups in chapters five and six, he says, teach and encourage these things. And if anyone teaches other doctrine or teachings and does not agree with the healthy teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness, he is conceited, understanding nothing uh, but has a sick interest in disputes and arguments over words. And from these come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions, constant disagreement among people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain, but godliness with contentment is great gain. He says this is a dangerous thing. Uh, these are teachings uh, that will pull Christians away from each other. They will pull them away from a faith in the true gospel of Jesus Christ uh, as the son of God who came into the world. And he says, and they're, they're totally focused on the wrong things. They're focused on themselves. They love themselves and they love money. He says, so they're using false words. They love to argue. They want to win arguments. They want to prove that they are more knowledgeable, more enlightened than others. And they love the controversy, uh, and they love to divide. We see that in our world today. There was an individual on being interviewed on uh, public radio the other day that was talking about uh, you know, the divisions that are go have gone on in our land over the last several years. And he said, what many of people learned either in politics or even in social media is that uh, division and causing division is actually very profitable uh, because you start gathering your group around you, uh, dividing it from others, and it becomes a source of revenue for the leader or the teacher. And we, it's going on in our world again today uh, because there are certain ones who want to stir everything up and they love the argument. They love to hear themselves talk and it has led to financial gain for them and they love the money. And that's what was going on with these false teachers. Uh, here is this motivation. And he's, he talks about how this can become one of those motivating factors uh, in what they teach and why they teach it. And they're, they're just not content uh, with what they have in this world. They're, they're wanting more. They're wanting more uh, popularity. They're wanting more control over other people's lives. And consequently, they love because they love money, which is what he gets into in this next little bit, reminding everybody that it is you, man of God, seek godliness with contentment. Uh, this is... Uh, something that is important. He told him earlier in chapter four to uh, going to the gym is valuable, but it's more valuable to train in godliness, which has value in this life and in the life to come. And do it, seek it with contentment, what God has given you, because we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these things. And yet that is not what we are taught to do 
in American society or Western society, especially in, in today's world. We are sought to seek more. Uh, we should want more. We should give ourselves to wanting more. And he says, there's danger in that. And he's going to pick up on that in just a minute. He said, pursue the godly things. Uh, because I want you to fight the good fight. This is your focus. Uh, and it's, he's used military terms earlier in the letter. Now he turns to sporting type terms. Uh, it's like a boxing match. Make sure you are in this fight, which is a good fight. It's not something that's seeking to divide. It's not something that you're seeking to gain from yourself, either in popularity, uh, power, or money. But the good fight, which is based on a godliness with contentment, the life that God has given us, and pursuing these godly things so that you can, as he says, uh, at the end of this section, that you will uh, fight the good fight of the faith, take hold of eternal life that you were called to and have made a good confession about in the presence of many witnesses. And it's an interesting image. Uh, it's a gift. Uh, salvation, eternal life, these are gifts from God. Uh, but it's something he doesn't just throw at us. He says, take hold of it, as you did in your good confession. Uh, we know, as we'll see next week, Timothy's grandmother and mother uh, were not only Jewish, but they became Christians. And they passed this faith along to him. But still, at some point, he had to make that confession himself. Uh, you know, whatever the parents do, or declare for you, or uh, do after you are born, whether it was circumcision for the Jews, or uh, infant baptism uh, today in some Christian churches, th those are part of the spiritual journey for many people. Uh, but as God told the Jews, just because you're circumcised doesn't mean uh, you have a good relationship with me. You must make this faith your own, and that's what he uh, Timothy had done in his own life. He had made his own confession. He had confessed his faith. He had been baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he says, continue this, this good fight to hold on to this eternal life that you have been given. Uh, because God has made all of this possible. Uh, these things sound like uh, something that could be overwhelming, but he says, no, God will make this happen. It is his plan that we do this because what we need to be seeking is treasure in heaven. He says to those who are rich in the present world, uh, yeah, there are traps to that. He never says in any of this that being wealthy is a sin, but be careful of the entrapment that can come because he's already said of uh, sort of that motivation behind the false teachers, those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money is uh, the root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves uh, with many pains. Back in chapter one, he already mentioned uh, two of those individuals, uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander, who had followed off in this direction. They gave in to the uh, trappings of this world and the desire for them. And now uh, they says, this love of money, this seeking it, wanting to be rich, and that becoming the focus of your life, um, can lead to a lot of bad things, just as it had done with the false teachers. But he comes back to it at the end, beginning in verse 17. Now, if you are rich, if God has blessed you, uh, it says, be careful, don't be arrogant. Uh, don't start patting yourself on the back uh, like the man in Jesus's parable who 
brought in his harvest and had to build more barns and he patted himself on the back uh, and said, look at all that I have accomplished. And God said, oh, you fool, uh, you're going to die this night. He can't take it with you, he says. Uh, as he's already mentioned, reminded uh, Timothy, we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out. So just like we've seen the example of the true widow in chapter five is one who put her whole hope in God uh, because she had no other means of support except her church family because she had no physical family and no other means of support. Uh, tell these people who have plenty to still put their hope in God and not in what they have. He encourages them then to go on and be rich in good deeds and store up treasure, real treasure, uh, that they may take hold of, at the end of verse 19, uh, life that is real. Uh, this reminds me of Jesus' parables in uh, Matthew uh, 6, uh, where during the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about, uh, number one, you can't serve two masters. Uh, you can't serve money and God. You will hate, if you try to serve two, you're going to hate the one and love the other. And the riches in this world have a great attraction uh, to our fleshly nature, our selfishness. But he goes on after that at the end of chapter six, say now, store up treasure in heaven. Uh, the things that won't rust or be destroyed and find the contentment that comes from putting your hope in God, knowing that he will take care of his people. And so those Christians who have been blessed with that, which is most of us here in the United States, especially compared to other countries uh, around the world, we need to be aware of this and make sure that we are putting our only hope in God through his son, Jesus Christ, and seeking to be rich in good deeds, the things that we do to help other people, or even using money to help them in their situation, such as taking care of the real widows who are truly in need, or anybody else who is in that kind of situation, and their church family can help them. In the end, he says, I want you to guard this deposit. Says, At the end, he closes out, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. Or to, another way to, to translate that word is what has been deposited with you. Uh, avoiding irre irreverent, empty speech and contradictions of the knowledge of the false teachers that by that name. And by professing it, some have deviated from the faith as he has mentioned a couple of times already. But he says, uh, empty speech or dangerous chatter is really a better translation of that phrase. You know, make sure that you are focusing on what is most important and real. Uh, I will mention briefly here uh, that final phrase of the letter, grace be with you all, or be with all of you. The you there is plural. So it's it's an indication that this letter, uh, though very personal in its instruction to Timothy, uh, was meant to be read by the entire group of Christians in Ephesus, uh, where Timothy was working. And, and that way, uh, you, you get this uh, open teaching, not only of about the false teachers and how uh, dangerous they are uh, because of the division they are trying to create, the focus they have on themselves and their own selfish wants, on the responsibility of Timothy to do these things and to teach these uh, various groups within the church family how they are to act within the household of God and how the, the leaders of the church, the kind of qualities that they are to have and how they uh, function and use the godliness and the blameless 
lives that they have already demonstrated to lead the rest of the congregation or the family in that direction. Uh, you just try to imagine, you know, Timothy standing before, you know, the group or little house churches meeting around the city and copies of this have been made and they're just, they're reading it out loud so that everybody hears what it is God wants to see in their church family, in his house, and the things that lead to godliness, a quiet life that is uh, lived in peace, the world around us, and it's full of godliness and holiness. But most of all, it stays focused on, and all of this comes from uh, the making sure that we guard the, that which has been deposited with us, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is uh, referred to in various ways throughout, but it's right in the very middle that we find this verse at the end of chapter three, that here is this gospel. He appeared in the flesh. God came to earth in the flesh, which was being disputed by some already in the first century, and then the second century became a major uh, topic of debate. But he, Paul says, he appeared in the flesh. He was vindicated by the Spirit. Now, when the Spirit descended on him as his baptism, he was not changing him to become something that he hadn't been before, but he was shown to be the Son of God as it was pronounced and as the Spirit came upon him. He was seen by angels. They were the ones who opened the grave and the first ones to see him come out of that grave. It was preached among the nations as Paul has been a part of, apostles was believed on in the world and taken up into glory. He is now sitting at the right hand of God, uh, waiting for that time when he will come back uh, to gather the family of God together and take them to be with them for all eternity. He says, this is the essence of the good news. It is the essence that we must stay focused on and not get in, caught up in all these other uh, silly arguments uh, that in many ways go back to us wanting to uh, focus on, I'm right, you're wrong. I can argue this better. Uh, I know more than you are. Consequently, I'm more spiritual than you are. And consequently, I may even question whether you're saved or not uh, because you don't agree with me on some of these things says, no, keep it centered around that core message, which then leads to all of these other applications of it that he has talked about in being rich in good deeds. Focus on how you treat others and how you live and the example you set. And as he has said throughout, especially be an example of godly people in your community so that there can be no slander. And so that, because God wants all to be saved, we become a, a walking message, a living message of the gospel of Jesus Christ as we live each and every day. And that is what he is wanting him to focus on. He wants them to focus on. And it is reiterated along with some other ideas in 2 Timothy. And you see here at the end of his life, uh, Paul is truly concerned uh, that people were getting away from focusing on what was most important. And he reminds Timothy to continue this ministry on in Ephesus and throughout the rest of his life to keep people focused on what is most important. And we must do the same thing today. We will pick up here with our uh, study of 2 Timothy starting next week. We look forward to our time together there. I encourage you to be reading ahead. Uh, Paul is back in Rome in prison for the final time before he is executed when he writes this letter. And it's important that we see uh, as he reiterates to Timothy, uh, as he sort of passes on to him his mantle of apostleship, of preaching the good news and keeping these early Christian communities focused on that good news. And so that's where we'll pick up next week. Look forward to that time together. And in the meantime, 
uh, God bless and may he keep you healthy and safe.